as Scott mentioned, I'll talk for a few minutes about a topic and then um, turn it over to whatever kind of questions people would like to speak of. Um, got some noise in the background there. So um, I have, have had a situation over the last couple of days where a family member, a close family member, is having some medical concerns. And we're in that process of testing and, and consults, and it's kind of serious but unfolding very slowly. And I was reminded of my total powerlessness about the situation. And I've been trying to apply um, a lot of my recovery tools to the situation, but it really got me thinking about surrender and surrender and powerlessness, but mostly surrender and recovery. So I've been kind of meditating on that. So I just wanted to mention a few thoughts that came and um, see, what, see where we go from there. So to me, in a situation like this where I'm totally powerless over it, uh, it was very parallel to my addiction, which I was really powerless over too, despite years of trying to control it um, ineffectively with many different means. Um, but the first thing I had to remember is, is being powerless and surrendering is not a sign of weakness. And I think um, for many years, what I told myself, the story I told myself was that um, I could do this, you know, whether it was white knuckle or control, or I could figure it out. I was always trying to figure out the right formula to do what I wanted to do in terms of my addiction, but not have the consequences. And um, I spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to do that. Never did get the right formula, but I realized that it was not at all a sign of weakness. And I also have realized that surrender for me in recovery is a willingness to feel and to feel whatever emotions come up because I think all of us with addiction really use it as a way to numb or escape or check out from uncomfortable feelings. So really, um, far from being a surrender, it was really I look at now as a courageous step because you have to kind of step into the unknown. We step through a door and we start with this willingness to feel uh, what our addictions have not allowed us to feel, you know, whether that was fear or uh, fear of the unknown, pain of the unknown, lack of certainty, as in this situation with my family member right now. So I think it's all about a willingness to really be present in our lives for whatever comes up. And in early recovery, especially, um, there's so many consequences of our addiction that it's, uh, there's a lot to deal with, clearly. Um, and also, I think, for me, it was a surrender of a fight. And it was a fight um, for the control. It was a fight against the addiction. It was, it was the winning, clearly. You know, I was defeated. Um, and I think that surrender was tremendously liberating for me. And that's, I'm going to talk about paradoxes in a, in a minute. But, but by just giving up, I, I got so much. And I got, um, I won in so many ways. Um, and it really, it also to me is a, is a way of uh, keeping our ego in check. And our ego is, for me, and I think for all of us, is where fear lives. It's where lack of trust springs from. It's that desire to be in control. All that stuff is ego-based. And that really um, is kind of the opposite of, of surrender for me. So I was thinking about some of the issues that I had when I first got sober and, and some of the things I see with my clients, um, some of the fears, if we admit we're powerless and do that willingness and we surrender, I mean, I had a big fear about like, what am I without the addiction? Or who am I? You know, what's going to be left? Because by the time I got into program, although I was pretty young, uh, it had totally consumed my life. And so my whole life revolved around the addiction, whether it was planning for it or acting out or feeling shame about it or recovering from it or whatever the stage may be, it all kind of centered around that addictive cycle. So I really didn't know who I was or what I was going to be when I took away my addiction. Uh, and that was a source of con some concern because I, like many of us, started my addictive behavior early. So I never really uh, had been an adult uh, or even a, an adolescent, mature adolescent without, without the drug. I also was worried, what am I going to feel? You know, because I was aware that I had a lot of unresolved issues. Um, and I was really afraid of not only feeling them, but how I was going to handle them, or, or if I could handle them. I, my belief was that they would overwhelm me. And I had to, to surrender that fear and, and ask for help and know that I would have the tools to get through it. Um, but, but that was a huge thing. And how will I manage those feelings? So, so that was all... Um, these aspects of surrender that were important to me then. And I wanted to read back, this is a little archaic language, but there's a psychiatrist named Thibault who um, did a lot of writing early on um, 
and he talked about surrender as a process, but his wording is so beautiful. It's, it's he, describing the moment when things get out of control. And he writes, unconscious defiance and grandiosity are the, for the time being rendered completely powerless by force of circumstance or reality. In other words, all these um, defiance, grandiosity, resistance, denial, uh, eventually all that comes crashing down in the face of reality and consequences. And for each of us that happens in different ways, whether it's through a partnership or a relationship breaking up or losing a job or losing our money or getting sick or whatever it happens to be. So I, I just really, his, his language to me captured sort of this grand um, ego that we have that really has to come down. So, and then I want to just talk about paradoxes. Uh, probably a lot of people have talked about paradoxes. You've seen it in meetings perhaps, but um, there's a couple of paradoxes that relate to this topic for me. And to me, the, the paradox of the first step is that when I admitted I was powerless over alcohol and drugs, that my life had become unmanageable, it actually led to great liberation. Uh, by surrendering, I really received freedom and, and my life back. Um, and so it, it led me into that further, deeper state of, of surrender. And there's another paradox I think is so important um, as we move through the steps. There's a number of them in the steps, but the one I want to just highlight here is that um, we have by by giving it away, we actually keep it. You know, we we uh, help people around us. We give it away. We share what we have. We're we are in community, and only by doing that. Um, do we actually keep all the gifts that we receive? So, and finally, in this situation with, with uh, my family member, you know, surrender, reminded of the serenity prayer, which we all know, but it's just, there's such wisdom in that. And for me, of course, and for all of us, probably the challenge is really letting go of the things I can't control um, and knowing what those are. And I have a better idea the many years into recovery of what those are, but boy, when a, when a new emotionally laden situation comes up, it, it all pops back and I have to go right back to basic tools, which is why I kind of went back to surrender today and surrender and powerlessness. So it's a, it's a vital first act for our recovery, um, but it's not a one-time deal. Uh, we keep doing it and not just for the addiction, for relationships, for situations, uh, people, places, things that continue to um, demonstrate that we're powerless over a bunch of stuff in our lives, except you know who we are and what we do with our recovery. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, thank you, David. Um, I'm always I always think about the quote. Sometimes people attribute it to Pat Carnes, but I'm, I doubt he came up with it. But um, he talks about um, sanity is a commitment to reality, or mental health is a, a commitment to reality, no matter what. And I always think of surrender as surrendering to my reality. Um, and once I accept my reality, then I can do something about it. And then that's, that's a huge victory. Right. Um, that's that's right. always how I conceptualize my surrender. It's, it's just, yeah. You know. And I was, for me, it was, I was in denial of, of kind of who I was and, you know, all, all the, the feelings and that I was bringing to the table and it, it was all about acceptance, not only of my addiction, but of me, of, of ultimately of me. Um, okay, we've got a couple questions. Um, in the chat feature, um, we've been asked to put a link to the author you referred to. Um, um, it's T-I-E-B-O-U-T, and I forget his, I think it's Thomas. Uh, he wrote, he, he was back like in the 30s, I think. All right, I'll, I'll dig up a link. Um, okay. And I'll take care of that for you. Okay, okay. thanks. Questions in the Q&A, so let's just get to those. Um, uh, this is from one of our regulars um, who is a porn addict. I'm doing well on my recovery on my porn addiction. Uh, good deal. Um, you know, I have the biggest fear that I would mess it up again. I know it's unavoidable, but I want to better equip myself when that happens. Any advice on that? Thank you. Hmm. Um, great question. Uh, yeah, and when you say um, mess it up again, you know, I don't know that it is inevitable. I know that with these intensity addictions like porn and sex addiction and chemsex, it, you know, it, it, relapse happens. Um, but I think the, what I've observed is that the, the more we work with 
sincerity and really work our program while we're working it, if we have trouble, uh, oftentimes all that work pays off in, in shortening, uh, kind of getting back up in the saddle, if you will. Um, and there's no guarantee of that, but I think my, in my experience, it, it's not that we lose everything. Uh, we kind of have, a, have a, a problem, a blip, and we get back up, we brush ourselves off and, and we've learned something about it. And to me, um, the best thing to do is to really do a kind of a, an autopsy uh, of the relapse or the, the problem, however you messed it up, to go back and see what happened. And, and what, what was that critical juncture where you could have done something different? And I think for most of us, for me at least, in my addiction, I would speed right through those, those critical junctures um, right into my problematic behavior without even realizing I had choices along the way. And so I think to really identify those choices and be aware of it. But um, I just think, uh, remember that shame and that whole shame spiral that occurs uh, when we feel we've messed up, um, it has no productive value. It just kind of traps us and bogs us down. So I'd avoid the negative feelings. I'd get, get right back up and, um, and get back in the game. And I think really the best way uh, to kind of take what, where you're at now, I think probably a healthy dose of caution and even fear is, is not bad. Because for me, at least, um, the process of surrender took a while when I first got into the 12-step program. And what kept me coming back was fear, fear that I was going to really mess it up and uh, uh, lose my chance to, to save my life at that point. So, um, yeah, I would just not lose sight of the risk, but also not focus on it and focus on your tools and the recovery and the gifts and the positive things that you're doing. Yeah, um, I can't find that. Um, I can't find a site on Kilo, so maybe we'll stick David on it. Um, yeah. I want to reiterate what David said about, um, you know, slips and relapses are not inevitable. <laughs> they just aren't. Um, but they're also not the end of the world when they do happen. Um, I have one sponsee who, um, he'll go, when I first started work with, working with him, he'd go a couple of weeks and then he'd have a slip. And now he goes three, four, five, six months, and then he'll have a slip. And um, I've reminded him that progress is a, is a really good thing. You know, it's progress, not perfection. Um, I don't want him to beat himself up <laughs> um, just because he, he messes it up. Um, and he really, you know, and the stuff he's doing now is nothing like what he was doing before. I mean, it's, it, this is massive pro progress for him. And sometimes sex addiction recovery is more about progress than perfection. So, um, so yeah. Um, Let's go to our next question here. Um, for me, words, uh, by the way, our, for those of you who joined us late, our topic is uh, surrender. Um, so um, there's, there's a lot of talk in 12-step recovery about surrender. So that's our topic tonight, but ask us questions about anything. Um, so the next question here, for me, words have great power. What they mean to me, their connotation is very strong. What tools can I use to understand and embrace surrender as a courageous action rather than admitting uh, weakness and helplessness. I do know that when I've been, been able to surrender, it has proven to be liberating, but it's still very tough after years of work and recovery. The surrender prayer is helpful and I lean on it often. Are there other tools I might use? Good question. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, you really write beautifully about this, the power of surrender and, and the gifts. For me, it was about reframing it. Um, reframing it for away from weakness and uh, failure into more of uh, a courageous, bold act. And I think it takes a lot of courage to walk into a 12 step meeting. I, I avoided it for a, a long time. Uh, and I, you know, I hear stories about people parking their cars outside the meeting and driving away and and uh, I, many times early on, I'd walk into a meeting and I'd walk right out. Uh, so it takes a lot of courage to, to do that. It takes a lot of courage to come into treatment. And so it takes courage to do this. And I really focus on, on the positive aspects of that, you know, in terms of the, the uh, strength it takes, the um, ability to uh, see ourselves as people who have um, choices and, and some power. In fact, the power of the ability to, to take that step forward. But I, for me, the, the trap, the, the, the dead end, 
was trying to look at surrender as some kind of weakness or moral failing or, or um, inevitable um, catastrophic failure because I was a bad person. You know, all that stuff that, that kind of resonated with my internal beliefs about what a terrible person I was. And uh, my addiction seemed to confirm all that. And so for me, it was, I have this image of like, you know, paratroopers when they kind of cut away the cord of their parachute when they land. I mean, it was, for me, I was like, it was like dragging me along the ground, all this addiction stuff. And I was able to really kind of, by, by surrendering and walking through that door, it, it allowed me to release that and just kind of be free of all that crap and proceed with my life and my healing. So I think um, it's very easy to get bogged down on, on the negative aspects of it, but I would really focus on um, the paradox, the paradox that uh, although it appears as if we're surrendering something, we're actually gaining our freedom. We're gaining uh, uh, a new life by giving up an old one. So I think that, that idea of change and paradox was, was really useful for me. Uh, yeah, for me, it was surrendering my denial, surrendering my insanity, and finding truth and reality and myself and freeing myself to live the life that I wanted to live. It, I was not, I was, I was surrendering a life that was miserable and <laughs> filled with problems. Um, yeah. You know, I don't want it anymore. It was easy to, it, was, it wasn't easy to give it up. It was hard to give it up, even though I didn't want it anymore, but, um, but it freed me to live a much, 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 much better life. So yeah. Um, I'm going to pull uh, out of our chat feature. Um, you mentioned that in early recovery, anxiety and negative emotions are common. Uh, I'm eight months into my recovery from sex and porn addiction, and I've been doing pretty well. Uh, in the first few months, I felt good because the problem I had was finally identified. However, I have so much anxiety over things I have done uh, that I don't do anymore in the past two to three months. Um, and speaking of surrender, how can this help with anxiety? I don't even know how I can surrender and accept. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations uh, on being eight months into recovery uh, and doing pretty well. That's, that's a big achievement. Um, so I think one of the things I mentioned, I think in the beginning was uh, when we surrender, we don't, we're surrendering also to the, the accepting, acceptance that we're gonna be feeling feelings. And addiction is all about keeping feelings at bay, you know, and, and we all have our unique constellation of what those are. You know, for me, it was anxiety and grief and shame and a couple other, you know, big ones. Um, everybody has their own kind of top three, perhaps. But, but my addiction uh, was really uh, served to kind of keep those away. And, then, and it didn't do it very well toward the end because they always pop through. But when I gave up all my protective uh, coding, I was able to really start to experience those and in much the same way you described your anxiety. And so I think um, what for me, what I had to do for me was to, first of all, identify the feeling. And when I first got sober, um, I really didn't know how to tell feelings. It was, uh, I felt good or I felt bad, mostly bad. Um, and then I felt fear. And then I, I kind of, it was like learning a new language. I kind of kept adding words uh, to describe feelings, but it was, that was the first step for me to identify it and then to really name it and try to feel it and release it. So, and that's really our task with feelings is to, to not let them sit and get locked into place. But feelings are, are, are early warning indicators. They're, they're what, um, they're our, our uh, information feedback from the universe, right? And so if we're feeling fear, that's a good thing. Uh, because it's telling us we may be in danger. Now, when fear doesn't get uh, processed adequately and released, it can turn into anxiety, which to me, anxiety is kind of fear that's been trapped and kind of is circulating around in an unhealthy way. So, so I guess to break it down in easy steps, I would identify the feeling, I'd try to feel it, and I'd release it with whatever that takes. And for me, releasing meant oftentimes just telling somebody about it was really adequate. I'd tell my sponsor, I'd tell a friend, I'd share it with somebody, sometimes uh, a primal scream, sometimes a journal entry, sometimes a run, um, sometimes playing with my dog and whatever. 
to kind of move it out. For the big things, uh, I probably mentioned this before, I like rituals. Um, and so uh, I, there were a couple times when I did a lot of writing and I would burn it in kind of a ceremonial way. And I lived near the ocean, so I was able to kind of tie things up in a bundle once and, and release it in the water. So, but however we do it, for me, the important thing is to like move it away from us. And so um, if you are hanging on to that anxiety for whatever reason, and sometimes, by the way, I'm, this is important to mention, um, sometimes we have underlying issues also. I mean, some of, some of us are anxious and some of us are depressed. And, and in addition to the uh, addiction, there may be other issues going on. I don't know in your case, but uh, that's something if it persists, I would have it checked out, you know, with a therapist or with a professional, and there may be some relief for you. But I think there are tools that can help with anxiety. Um, there is a fabulous anxiety workbook, which I'm drawing a blank on, I'll try to remember it. Um, but there are tools out there for anxiety. But I think really to examine what you're doing to hang on to it and let it go if you can. The other thing I'll mention is that uh, sometimes therapists look for what we call secondary gain, which would mean that uh, if I'm holding on to a feeling uh, and I just can't seem to get rid of it, you know, maybe there's a reason why I'm holding on to it. Maybe it's doing something for me, healthy or not. And so, you know, examining it in a deeper way. Uh, the other thing, and I'm talking a lot here, sorry, Scott. Um, uh, I'm an old Gestalt therapist. Um, and so, Gestalt does kind of cool things, but a Gestalt therapist in that case would say, well, let's take your anxiety, give it a voice. And, you know, what would, what would your anxiety tell you? What does it have to say? And kind of, and it, it sounds weird. You have to kind of be let, let go of your self-consciousness. But uh, sometimes you can get, hear some interesting things by giving those feelings or parts of our bodies a voice and letting them talk. And uh, they can sometimes tell you what's going on. I yeah, I, I, I actually love um, the idea of using gestalt with, with strong emotions and feelings, particularly for people in early recovery. You know, I, I had no idea, A, what I was feeling. Um, I had a, a sheet of paper with, this was 20 years ago, so we didn't know what emojis were, but they were emojis, basically, with, you know, anxiety, depression, anger, fear, you know, every feeling you could think of with a little face. And I would look at it and go, this one, I'm feeling this. Um, and, and then I would have to sit with that feeling and listen to it and, and hear what it had to say. Um, and I like the idea of actually uh, really letting it talk. Um, and it, it, the feelings will go away um, eventually, um, good or bad. They don't last forever. Um, I also wanted to uh, validate um, the fact that you, you mentioned in early recovery, um, you were feeling great because you understood what the problem was finally and you were doing something about it. And that's very, very common. Um, in our treatment center in LA, um, the guys are either on the pink cloud um, like that. It's like, yay, I know what the problem is. I'm gonna fix it now. Or they're just miserable and depressed and angry. Um, those, are, those are like the two states of being for people in early recovery. Um, and they both, um, like feelings, don't last. Um, and after a couple months of being on the pink cloud, you're gonna come back to earth. Um, or after a couple months of being miserable, you're gonna to start to feel better about yourself, you know, for the same reasons people hop on the pink cloud right away. So this is normal. And you know, when I'm working with people, I always want them to know this is normal and it's not going to last. You know, it's, this is where you are right now. It's part of the process. Um, and again, this is kind of surrender. Just accept that this is part of the process. And sometimes, right. Um, I find that knowing this is part of the process, other people have been through this, it's normal um, and expected, um, takes the power away from it. So, yeah, for sure. Uh, hang in there because um, yeah. this stage won't last either. <laughs> um, okay, next, next question here. Um, it's been almost five months <laughs> since separating from my sex addicted husband. Uh, the divorce is in process. Uh, he claims to be actively working on his recovery but he seems to still not understand or care about the damage he has caused with his many betrayals and high risk behavior. Um, how long into recovery does someone realize the extent of what they have done? 
Um, I keep getting triggered by emails he sends, and I don't want to make any serious future decisions out of anger, good for you. Um, I'm working really hard on my recovery, but it's really hard, and I don't feel like I'll ever get closure. There's a lot packed into that statement. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for asking that. I think, um, first of all, I'd encourage you to like look at your boundaries with your husband, who's or soon to be ex-husband if a divorce is in the process, um, especially if he's in not in a, a good place, because by sort of exchanging those communications, uh, it's continuing to kind of keep you upset. And I think it's, uh, you have every right to sort of put a really clear boundary and limit communication uh, to the degree that you're comfortable with. Um, and obviously you're doing work on yourself uh, and he's not, not quite to the degree that you are. So I think, you know, there's no time frame on that. I, I've seen people kind of stay stuck in that where they don't really get into a, a good recovery. And I think that leads to relapse if people can't really understand uh, what they've done. You know, I think one of the classic uh, stages of recovery from, for a sex addict is really to understand, gain empathy and to understand the impact that his or her behavior has had on the people around them, particularly their spouse. And I think it's, that's part of this denial that we were speaking of in the beginning, the ego that's going on where it's kind of all about us and the swirl about us as the addict um, without really understanding. You know, and and it, one of the things we do in Seeking Integrity is have spouses write a letter that's read to the client, sometimes in groups, sometimes privately. But somehow hearing those words, um, that really is a profound tool to help the, the addict break through and really understand some of the impact they've had. Um, but, but that's not something um, that does, it comes easily. It, it's something that has to be done. There's a surrender the addict needs to do too, to be able to sort of understand the uh, damage they've done because that, that ego defense is just keeping it all away. Um, and so you're dealing with someone really who's, um, you know, still, I don't want to say he's an active addiction, but he's not along the path of recovery to the point um, where I think that you can have any really beneficial interaction or communication in that regard. So I would, I would um, reduce your expectations. I would set clear boundaries and start really focusing on you and what you need. And I think the stronger you get in that regard, the clearer how you interact with him will, will become. Um, I'm sorry, but he's not getting it. it. That's pretty typical. And it's something I think that most sex addicts have to really move through to understand the impact um, they've had. And I would certainly not make any serious decisions at this point. Um, you know, we talk about not making decisions for a year, uh, but when things are in, in motion like this and in flux, uh, this is not the time to make any kind of decision like that. This is time to take care of you and consolidate yourself. And because the decision you make today, I guarantee you, is not the decision you would make in three months or in six months. Things are changing right now. Things are moving. And it's, it's in motion. So I wouldn't uh, make any final decisions at all. But I would just really focus on taking care of you. Yeah, and, and um, David mentioned setting good boundaries. Um, with your husband or possibly soon to be ex-husband or depending on you know, how things work out. Um, setting boundaries are not about controlling other people. There's always a lot of confusion uh, about that. Um, boundaries are about our own behavior. Um, we cannot control other people. Your husband is going to do what he's going to do. Um, what you can control is how you respond or don't respond. Um, you can say, if you send me these emails that trigger me, I'm not going to answer them anymore. Um, we can deal with it in therapy if, if it's really an issue or, you know, you can set boundaries like that, but it's about you. I'm going to protect myself because, you know, sometimes these emails trigger me. Um, you know, you can control yourself and how you respond. Um, you can't control what he's going to do. Um, so you have to think about, you know, what you're willing to do when you're triggered and what you're willing, what you're not willing to do. You know, we always tell people, you know, don't make threats. Like if I find more porn on your computer, I'm leaving you and taking the kids and that's it. Don't make that threat unless you're willing to follow through um, because you lose credibility. I mean, 
if you set that boundary, you'd better follow through on it. Um, so, you know, work through your boundaries. If you've got a therapist, work through boundaries with your therapist. So, and, and I think really for, for the spouses or partners, it's a very similar process of surrender, right? You're powerless over the addict and uh, you can't control him or her. And it's really important to kind of just um, let that go, let the, the control issues go. Um, and, then, and that includes expectations sometimes and, and really focus on, on you. I think it's, uh, that's really the direction to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question here. Um, this is a follow up uh, about surrendering to reality. Uh, reality is such a scary thing to, to accept. Um, I'm used to creating my reality in my addiction. How can I best ground myself and identify what is truly real and what I want it to be? Um, wow. Yeah. I, uh, in early recovery, I, I was moving kind of from this fantasy land of my addiction and how I thought my life was and looked. Um, and reality kind of hit me very hard uh, in terms of consequences. And then slowly I kind of learned kind of what my life was really about. Uh, um, but it was for me. It wasn't like a, an overnight wake up call. I had to kind of re really discover who I was, what my gifts were, what my talents were, what my situations was, who, who my friends were. Uh, all that stuff kind of took time to unfold. And I'll tell you, the, the guiding principle or uh, the North Star is a better metaphor um, for me was the program because I didn't know what my reality was. I didn't know who I could trust outside. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I didn't know what my health was going to turn out to be. So uh, all I had was program and meetings and I just, I, that's, that became my reality. And really it, the, the, the context of those meetings, the safety of those meetings, the communication, the support, the connection, that really grew into what became my reality and in recovery. Um, so, uh, so it was all about being around people I trusted, letting it grow very slowly. And for me doing a lot of reality testing, checking, I, I didn't trust myself, I didn't trust my own feelings. Uh, even when I was really committed to recovery, I, I didn't know what I was feeling really, I didn't trust it, I didn't trust my motives. Uh, it was like I was living with um, a, a dangerous person inside me that was going to kind of come out at any moment. I was really afraid about that. And, and so I, I constantly checked out feelings, you know, gee, I have a, a, a desire to do this, or I want to do really stupid stuff, you know, go, I want to go to a movie. <laughs> do you think I'm kind of avoiding worry just to really check in on things that I was going to do um, and get feedback on it from people to see if that's if it made sense to them, because really everything uh, everything was upside down, and so reality was kind of uh, a mystery to me, and it, gra it gradually unfolded. But but I think the, the important thing was that I had people, a few people at least, around me that I trusted, and if they told me uh, you're really your thinking is really screwy on this issue, I, I believed them over myself, and. Uh, or I'd check it out with another people and I'd do a consensus. But I think um, it's important to just kind of be patient with yourself, not necessarily trust your internal messages and, and uh, get support and help from people who can mirror back to you what they see and be willing to accept the feedback. That's the other thing I had to hear. I'd, and it's a good exercise. We do this in therapy too, to ask people, you know, are you willing to accept feedback from someone? Because sometimes, we can have people telling us accurate things, but we don't want to hear it. We shut it out. So I think it, I had to be willing, and there's that word again, willing to um, receive feedback that really helped me get back on kind of a more reality-based uh, life path. Yeah, Scott, I don't know if you have words on that one. Yeah, I, I really identify with <laughs> this question. It's like, what's real and what's not real? I, I grew up, um, in a house with a mother who, who created the world as she wanted it to be in, in her mind. And if anybody challenged that, she went crazy. So we all just learned to live in this reality that had nothing to do with reality. 
Um, my first therapist handed me the book Ordinary People. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever read that book or seen the movie, but Mary Tyler Moore is my mother. Um, you know, she, wow. she, the world is crumbling, but not according to her. Um, and for me, that was very good training, uh, at, you know, as a future sex addict, um, learning to live in, in fantasy. Um, and that's what I did. Uh, you know, I started reading and then I discovered, you know, alcohol and drugs and sex. And, and my world, the world that I lived in had nothing to do with reality. And, and I think that's very, very common for sex addicts and porn addicts in particular. Um, you know, I've had long-term, wonderful, hot sexual relationships with hundreds of people and they don't even know it because it was all a fantasy. It was all in my head. Um, you know, my best relationships never happened. Um, you know, my best memories never happened. Um, and it was very hard to commit to reality, to surrender my insanity and commit to reality. Um, and, and like David, I had to rely on other people. And I still have to reality check sometimes. Um, this is, this is, you know, is this real? Is it, you know, and I need people to just reflect back to me like, no, you're crazy again. Um, because sometimes I am. So, yeah, reality involves other people. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next question. I'm getting very close to being willing to, I love, the, I love the way this is phrased. I'm getting very close to being willing to delete about 2.5 terabytes of adult movies, uh, which I've collected over the past 12 years or so. Are there any suggestions to make this process uh, more useful, helpful, etc.? cetera? Uh, so yeah, the, the, phrase, the phrasing is interesting. Getting close to, I would just encourage you to go ahead and, and pull the trigger on that. Uh, and maybe look at why, what, what's holding it up there. Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's, a, it's an artifact of your addiction, right? This, this huge collection of stuff that really is, to me, is a symbol of, um, of the addiction itself. And so I think, first of all, I wouldn't waste too much time thinking about doing it. I would do it. Um, but I would do it when I do stuff like that, when I'm releasing things that really don't serve me any longer, and that certainly doesn't serve you, never did probably, um, I try to set an intention or uh, say a, like a little affirmation or phrase, you know, that I, I now, you know, release this stuff to, to the universe that never, never really served me. And, you know, my intention is to be free of it or wh whatever words work for you. I, I like to just kind of um, not just hit the delete button, which you need to do, you know, without haste, but to really say something that kind of wraps up the intention of it. And what is it? I mean, beyond two and a half terabytes of stuff, what does it represent to you? Does it represent, you know, your um, addiction or your uh, fear or your shame? I, I'd really kind of put a name on it because it's, it's more than just the movies. It's, it represents something. And I, I think it's important to not lose the opportunity to, um, release whatever else is attached to that. Um, so I, th I think it's important, but I wouldn't think about it too much. I'd get rid of it. There's no point in hanging out on that stuff. Um, Scott, any suggestions on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do more kind of brass tack stuff here. Um, if you have a sponsor or a therapist or a friend who supports your recovery, um, have them do it with you. Don't do it alone. Um, because if, in my experience, when people do this alone, they sort of uh, relive it and say, well, well, I'll keep this one. And I mean, it's very easy to say, oh, well, you know, it's very easy to not do it or not do it right or look at all of them on their way out the door and two and a half terabytes and take you like a month uh, to look at all of them. Um, you know, and beyond that, um, if you've used an external storage device, uh, take a hammer and destroy it. Um, I don't care if you pay $200 for it, destroy it. Um, if you have VHS tapes, DVDs, things like that, um, if you've got a blowtorch, melt them uh, before you throw them away. If you don't, um, drive them 20 miles from your house, throw them in a dumpster and, and, and drive home. And again, take somebody with you. Um, 
there, there are a couple of reasons to take somebody with you, have somebody else with you as you do this. Um, one of which is to make sure you actually do it. And the other one is you're going to need support because you're just throwing away your, your most prominent relationship for 12 years, it sounds right. like. Um, you're going to be in a mood. <laughs> um, you're going to need somebody there to walk you through it. Um, so yeah, but, um, but get rid of it and, and, and destroy it. Um, you know, if you've got an old laptop and you can afford a new one, and, you know, if you've got an old laptop and you run two and a half terabytes of adult videos through it, you, you're so riddled with uh, viruses and, and worms and whatever that the machine probably barely works anyway and it's time for a new one. I mean, really get rid of everything, not just the, the digital, but the physical that came with it. Um, Great advice. And, and the same, there's really a lot of parallels there for, for uh, uh, people who use substances too. It, we, you know, it's not unusual for somebody to come home from treatment and they have stashes around, you know, so we always recommend people um, have their place cleaned out of, of drugs or if they are doing it themselves to have to go always, always, always with someone else when they're doing that for the exactly the same reasons, because uh, it's real hard once it's kind of there and you're connected to it again to kind of release it, there's a chance that you'll actually get in trouble with it, but also there's a lot of emotions uh, involved. Absolutely, the same, same parallel with drugs and alcohol. Yeah, it's, it's a very triggering experience in, in kind of a good way, but also in a bad way. I mean, it can take you right back out there, the emotions that you're gonna feel. Yeah. Um, so, um, a whole bunch of questions here. Uh, next one, I am usually pretty good about what I'm feeling as well as locating it in my body. Um, lately, I've been getting a feeling in my belly button that I cannot identify. Um, it's something I've felt before, but I don't know what it is. I have a feeling it is a negative, negative, in quote marks, emotion. It feels hollow. Ah, interesting. Um, yeah, and just for people that don't do that, I think it's always important to, uh, if you're having an emotion, kind of see where it, where it is in your body. Um, we usually have a, have a place and it varies for people. You know, anxiety for me is in my, my shoulders and my neck and, uh, or in my voice and my, in my throat. So just kind of know what's what when you feel it. Cause oftentimes our bodies will experience the, the emotion before it becomes conscious in our brain. And it, it really helps to kind of be aware. Um, boy, if I were, uh, a Freudian, I would say the belly button is all about birth and, and uh, all that stuff. Uh, I have no idea what that means. Um, you might want to do that gestalt thing. Give it a voice. Uh, what, is it, what does it have to say to you? Um, but I think I really applaud your sensitivity to um, these feelings and where you're experiencing and what they might mean. Because I think it's really important self-examination that we can all learn from. You know, for me, getting clean and sober was not just about the act of giving up my drugs, but it was about really kind of rediscovering life below my neck. You know, I was all, my addiction was all up in my head. And I, as Scott was saying, I had to learn what feelings were um, using, this, using the same sheet, by the way, um, but also just to kind of learn what was going on with my body and what, what I was feeling, what it meant. So it sounds like you're really in tune with that, but um, it might be useful to talk to somebody about it because there's a lot of, uh, interesting work that's done. You know, our bodies hold memories, our bodies hold experience in a way that may not be conscious. You know, we know this from trauma. Trauma, a lot of trauma is held physically and it's not a cognitive, it's not a story, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's locked in our, in our cells. Um, and a lot of different kinds of therapies can release that um, with breath work or other kinds of things. But, but I think it's really important that you're aware of it um, I would explore it. It sounds if nothing, nothing else intriguing. Um, but I mean, belly button seems all kinds of uh, birth issues to me. Uh, but I have no idea, but I think it's really interesting and I uh, wish you luck with that. Yeah. Feelings are for me are very somatic. I mean, I know where my depression lives. I know where my stress lives. I know where my anxiety lives. Um, Right now, nothing lives in my belly button. If I wake up tomorrow and I'm having a feeling in my belly button, uh, <laughs> I'm going to email you. <laughs> Say thanks. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Um, if you want to look in the chat feature, um, David did find a link to Harry Tebow. No wonder yeah. I couldn't find Thomas Tebow. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> and and uh, somebody else also uh, posted the link there about emotions. Um, so thank you. Um, let's see. Um, this is a follow up of, uh, about the divorce. Um, thank you for your input. I really appreciate it. I will check my expectations. Um, right now, the internet actions are limited to emails about money and divorce related stuff. Well, I can understand how those would be triggering. Um, he's in a big hurry for this divorce to be done with, um, and I need to surrender to the fact that he's still completely self centered. LOL. Um, you need to surrender to the fact that he's in a big hurry for the divorce to be done with. Um, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't know if it's uh, possible or practical, but. Um... I wonder if you could have all those things go through a third party, like your attorney or, or someone else who could kind of screen them for you and deal with it uh, in a superficial way, at least, so that you could kind of not be hit with it directly all the time. Um, but yeah, just I, same, same stuff, you know, boundaries and, um, and surrendering to that. And, and again, not making sure you're following your own needs. Right. I mean, he has an agenda. He has needs. It sounds like um, you need to make sure that you're clear on what you want and what you need um, and and not be kind of bullied or pushed or rushed to whatever that is. Yeah. Surrendering doesn't mean you have to become a doormat. Um, right. You know, just surrendering means you're not going to be able to control him, but you can control how you respond to him. Right. Um, Okay, next one here. Um, I took some notes. I took notes on some online classes. I printed this out and referred to it a lot. Um, it's on cognitive distortions. Um, I know it's long, but don't worry about reading it all. Beliefs equals thoughts. Beliefs equal thoughts and or facts plus personal interpretation. Um, and that produces what we come to believe. Um, David, would, would you mind talking a little just, uh, just about that? Uh, there is a lot here. I don't go through all of it, but beliefs equal you know, basically thoughts and or facts plus personal interpretation. Right. So, uh, you know, we have one of the classic hallmarks of addiction is really a lot of kind of mistaken core beliefs about ourselves and about the world sometimes. But um, I think a lot of us grew up in maybe adverse circumstances and had a lot of negative beliefs about ourselves and who we are and uh, maybe feeling less uh, than worthy uh, feeling uh, unloved, feeling unsafe, uh, feeling um, like we'll always be a failure, whatever messages were given to us. So these core beliefs operate at a very deep level. And I think sometimes when the world uh, interacts with those, when we, when we go through the world and something happens, we uh, frame that, um, we frame our reaction to it based on our belief of, of our interpretation. Um, and so if uh, I can't think of a great example. Um, one, one of the things I learned early in therapy was the concept of reframing. Um, I can't go to a 12 step meeting because I'm too busy, you know, or something. And, and my therapist would make me reframe that, um, you know, uh, something that he would make me surrender to reality a little bit. Um, that's not even a good example, but, um, nobody will ever want to date me because I'm a sex addict. Reframe that. Someone might like me because I'm working on my issues. That's a reframing. And, and it's right. my interpretation of a fact. I'm a sex addict, but how I choose to interpret it. And we do have a choice on how we choose to interpret. Right. And those, that process is so automatic. We, we kind of apply meaning. It's not, we don't consciously think about it. It's just there. And so part of recovery and changing that is to, um, this process of reframing, to really learn, uh, what distorted beliefs are, are impacting both our thoughts and our feelings, our emotions. You know, and she mentioned cognitive distortions. I love those. You know, they're, um, it's really important to, to go over those sometime, you know, with, and an example would be black and white thinking, you know, putting the world into this choice or that choice. You know, I have to do this or else this will happen. Uh, and oftentimes we have many, many more choices, catastrophizing, minimizing, uh, jumping to conclusions. Uh, all these are examples of, of how we kind of take things in the world and maybe kind of twist them and distort them in ways that aren't necessarily healthy for us. So again, coming back to reality and, and um, understanding 
those cognitive distortions and uh, our beliefs about ourselves uh, and how those have to change. Um, you know, one of the, I think, maybe essential elements of surrender, and which we've been talking about tonight, is this, at some level, it's at least a little spark of a belief that we're worth it. You know, I think uh, we have to believe that we're worth it or we're not going to make the effort to do this. And I think sometimes that's the tiniest of little sparks. But I think you really have to hang on to that because that's, that will grow into something wonderful uh, if, we, if we nurture it. Um, but, but I think, and a lot of us, I think, probably feel that we're not worth it, e either because of the, what we've done in our addiction or who we think we are based on what we've always been told by people. Um, but at some point, we have to s surrender that those things may not be true and, and try something else. So, yeah, that's important stuff. That's all the cognitive behavioral stuff. But, but if people are interested, I'd recommend looking at cognitive distortions. And there's lists of them, and they're really useful to see how we maybe misinterpret the world sometimes. Yeah, just, just Google cognitive distortion. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we do exercises at our treatment center um, based on you know, overcoming cognitive distortions. Um, we, have, we have some cool stuff that we do. Um, speaking of cognitive distortions, I'm going to read just the first sentence. Um, and it's not the person who's, who typed this that has the cognitive distortion, but uh, <laughs> I'll just read the first sentence. My, my spouse has said that he finally accepted responsibility for the horrible person he was. Can you hear a cognitive distortion there, David? Yeah, yeah well, um, finally accepted responsibility for the horrible person he was. Well, that could be interpreted as empathy, too. But Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the distortion from the addict's point of view is, you know, I'm a decent person who did horrible things. Um, that doesn't make me a horrible person. That makes me an addict. Um, who behaved horribly. Um, yeah, and that's, that's an important distinction that we also emphasize in treatment is that um, the, we're not horrible people, all right? Addicts are not horrible people. They're, they're good people, decent people who have, may have done bad or horrible things based on their addiction. But I think, because um, if I believe I'm a horrible person, again, that's, where's the self-worth to recover? Where's the where do I go with that? And so I think it's really important to, yeah, you, you, to, to distinguish the actions of the person from the essence of the person. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah, and that, that's the difference between guilt and shame, which um, Brene Brown explains it as well as anyone. Um, but um, you know, guilt is I did something bad and I feel badly about it and I need to change my behavior in the future and I think I'd like to do that. Shame is I am bad, there's nothing I can do about it, so I might as well continue to be bad. Um, right. And, and, you know, I'm a horrible person, that's shame. I did horrible things, that's guilt. Um, one right. is a good emotion to have, guilt. Shame is just not productive. It just sucks us into a cesspool and keeps us there. Right, um, right. Um, yeah, that, that whole belief that there's something, shame, really is that I'm flawed, I'm damaged goods, There's, I'm essentially uh, unworthy and, and uh, damaged. And I think that's just, uh, as we talk about with shame, that there's no way to go with that. There's no productive uh, therapy we can apply to that to, to make something good out of it. It's just a kind of a dead end, um, but yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so let's go to this, this, this uh, last question we've got here. Um, my spouse said he, that he finally accepted responsibility for the horrible person he was. He said he was too ashamed to do this, and that is where he was stuck. Now that he understands his reality, he seems to have turned the corner and doesn't feel the weight or burden of his bad choices. Um, which is kind of what we just talked about a little bit. Um, yeah, so I think uh, there is a, an experience of the addict when they kind of take ownership of what they've done and and responsibility for it, and there is a, a relief of that, um, for sure. It's a it's a weight that's lifted. Um, the the trick with that sometimes is the timing of the experience of the addict sometimes doesn't match the timing of the partner. The partner may not be over it as quickly as the addict 
maybe. And that's where uh, each needs their support uh, in that process. But um, it sounds like he's on the path. I think that, that uh, releasing that is an important step. I think the distinguished, uh, th that Scott pointed out is really an important one, that you know, he, he's not a horrible person. Uh, and, and to really believe that um, it's his action on the disease and to really make that distinction, I think is gonna be really important for him down the road. But um, I'm glad he's having some beneficial experience uh, of his recovery. Um, yeah, and they're, 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 to take us back to our topic of surrender, um, now that he understands his reality, he seems to have turned the corner. I mean, that is surrender and addiction uh, in a nutshell right there. Once we understand and accept our reality, then we can turn the corner and do something about it. Um, right, right. So, um, yeah. we are, we're out of time, but David, do you want to recap us on surrender and, and kind of take us out? Yeah, just that it's, it's not a sign of weakness. It's, it's uh, really takes a lot of strength, I think, to release this way of life that was not working and to walk through the door. And, and just, I wanna really, I guess, close with the paradoxes, you know, to, that by surrendering, we, we really gain everything. And that by uh, constantly giving it away in the process of these steps, we're able to keep it and, and live it. So it's a, it's a big process. That's it. Great, great topic, David. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We yes, will be indeed. back next Wednesday. Um, and we have sessions pretty much every day um, hosted by different people. So if you need something tomorrow, check in tomorrow. I think we have something on Thursday. Um, so, David, thank you. We'll see you next week. And Thanks, we'll see everybody yep. else next week. All right, everyone. Take care. Thank you.